Okay, folks, how are we doing? Uh, give us a wave in the chat if you can see us. Because we are back. This lovely moment. Pause. Please give me a wave in the chat if you can see me. <laughs> there we go. There's Nay. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, it's been a really long day. And the first thing I want to do uh, is just thank everybody. Um, I think those of us who are used to attending in-person conferences know how tiring they can be. And in some ways, this is a more accessible medium, but in other ways, it's also more exhausting and more to do. Um, so uh, well done for staying with us. Um, those of you who do have uh, extra kind of energy, we will be holding a Zoom space although some of us may be lying in a darkened room instead <laughs> doing that and eating that's the other thing some of us need to do is eat um but anyway um we have with us at the moment we have matt carrot Car Car gibbs again we have meg john barker david robertson is here somewhere um uh, hopefully and uh is is reconnecting and uh hopefully Sitna will be with us soon anyway but let's start because my screen is organized in this way let's start with matt so it has been a very long day we've had a really diverse selection of papers and discussions to consider um can you give us a sense of some of the connections and concepts which have really inspired you today yeah um so much absolutely um I've just been frantically scribbling down some notes amongst other notes to try and make more notes, it seems at the moment. But I think for me, um, the major theme that stuck out for me is one of liminality in many ways. And that idea of using liminality or these threshold spaces to feel a bit uncertain and to accept that uncertainty. Um, and I think that's been quite powerful in that sense to see these threshold spaces of borders for something else. Um, so in conversations we've found with, that I've been to, we've explored injustices, fears, care, production. And I think as well for me, what particularly stuck out in particular was kind of um, Ori's paper on missingness and Beth's um, paper considering this kind of approach of auto thanatology. Because for me, these ideas of something missing and that deep-seated reflection suggests needing for change. Liminality and thresholds suggest the end of something and the beginning of something else. And I suppose that the hope that that something else to come would be more positive, more just, more equitable. Um, and I think as well, accepting from um, Alison's paper just then, that idea for a call to say that we're unsure of something and to actually be able to use that uncertainty as a tool and to almost be empowered by our uncertainty to move forward from that. And I hope what I just said was in some way coherent. <laughs> um it made a lot of sense to me. I don't know about anyone else. I think I'm so used to thinking about liminality as a spatial metaphor. It's really interesting to be reminded of it as a as a temporal metaphor as well, that it can be a space that you can use it to move through rather than uh, a place that you're in. Um, and I think that's a really interesting uh, thing to pull out of, of what we've seen um, today. Um, yeah, okay, so coming to Megdon then. Hi, yes. Oh, that's a bit echoey. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, two pieces, one of which is pretty much the same as Matt's, I guess, um, around non-binary and liminal thinking. And the other one is about the different forms of knowledge and practice that we prioritise in academic spaces or alternative academic spaces, which kind of picks up on some themes we had this morning, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, if people aren't aware, I wrote a book called Life Isn't Binary, where I was taking bisexual and kind of non-binary experiences are jumping off points thinking to, to thinking about how people might find non-binary thinking and ways of being helpful in other areas as well um 
and that was aimed at a, a sort of general audience and I was just really excited to hear those themes picked up here in areas I hadn't thought about yet so obviously we had Chris's excellent paper around bisexuality and challenges to monosexual thinking which is something I'm fairly familiar with but not in that time period so that was really interesting and then um, oh I should apologize if I get anyone's names wrong as well I'm really tired by this point but I think that was Chris and then uh, Amelisis on Mestiza experience as well um, and sort of um, immigrants experiences and mixed race experiences was something that um, Alex my co-author was writing about in the, the Life Isn't Binary book but but how this got extended so we, I guess we were thinking about academic and alternative academic spaces and that binary but also the, I thought with with your paper as well Theo there was this kind of you know who's the expert and the fact that yoga practitioners are drawing on academic stuff in their own conversations starts a few people are troubling this kind of re expert researcher versus participant binary and then we had Chris's challenges to the religion non-religion binary which I absolutely loved Ari's on the life death binary and how missing people with family who are missing challenged the whole life death binary and then Alison's call to not knowing I also picked up on and, and loved that idea um yeah so so something about yeah that value of of being with uncertainty in relation to all these things and oh yeah with Chris and Alison's paper as well I was struck by the value of this idea of being in relation to something rather than are you religious or non-religious or is this sex or is this not sex it's like these are the things that are in relation to religion or in relation to sex or in relation to kink um oh yeah and also Giorgio's right at the beginning for me fantastic paper on superhero comics and death it was amazing and the fiction reality binary got uh questioned in that one so yeah lots of great binary busting and then yeah just really thinking about this you know I guess while this was such a different conference in some ways it still had that quite similar style of like we're familiar with the PowerPoint presentation um and quite intellectual knowledge and so I'm really sorry I missed Sigrid's uh, talk about anger and emotion because I thought that was probably really from the abstract really interesting on this about how how the rational gets emphasized over the emotional and how gendered and raced and classed that is um, and what would it mean to bring more emotion into these spaces what would that even look like emotional practices emotional knowledge and it speaks to something Matt said earlier around vulnerability as well and how you know we have to prior we have to put forward these versions of ourselves in these spaces that deny the kind of vulner more vulnerable or childish or traumatized parts of us perhaps um, and I've been reading some stuff I don't know if you're familiar Theo with Beth Barilla who writes about yoga and social justice and um, she talks a lot about contemplative pedagogy and how if we're going to be teaching students like critical race theory or social justice ideas or about climate injustice or these big things that are just going to hit them with a lot, uh, especially at the moment. Um, you know, how do we how do we handle the feeling side of it? And could we bring in these contemplative pedagogical practices alongside the intellectual learning? And what would it look like to weave those together? And I guess just to leave the organizers with a kind of question mark around that. I think it sits with Sitna's points earlier about decolonizing the curriculum and how we go about valuing diverse knowledges and practices. And yeah, what would it look like on a day like this if we were really to value emotion and ration, you know, question the emotion rational <laughs> binary, but, um, you know, value those equally or value the, you know, the embodied practices and knowledges as highly as we value the more intellectual heady ones. Um, that's what I'm left wondering about. Um, yeah it, that's a really really interesting question um and uh it was it was interesting to me for example because so much of my intellectual practice and personal practice involves around movement and embodiment um that uh if it wasn't for kind of uh the the wind interference and the connectivity it would have been great to give my paper on my walk this afternoon because i walk about five miles a day and that's part of my practice and that feels like a much more interesting space to be speaking from in some ways. And, uh, you know, how can we how can we speak in different embodied spaces? And I'm aware that uh, without naming any kind of names at all, there were there have been times at academic conferences when some of us have pushed for inclusion of practices and uh, the, essentially a version of exp essentially it's experimental religious studies in the same way as you would have experimental archaeology or so on and so forth. And the nervousness of some colleagues around that uh, because it feels too much like theology 
um, to actually be doing things even, you know, and then again, where is that line? Where is that line between participant and researcher and observer? Um, and, and how are we um, acknowledging those places? I think it's uh, uh, some very interesting questions to be talking about, particularly when we're talking about alternative academic environments. Um, because if you're talking about true engagement, um, then you're talking about going where people are at and listening to what's actually going on for them, and what they're actually doing. That means getting getting your hands dirty, I think, in many ways. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to continue with you two whilst I figure out whether uh, we can get anyone else on the call. So Matt, um, I, I'm aware, you know, we've got plenty of time and I'm aware this is a big question, um, but with this conference, what we set out to do as Altac is to do something that is both informed by and yet also different from a traditional academic conference. It feels like moving on from what Meg John's saying that that would be a really interesting question to return to. Like, did we succeed? And what has today taught us about academic spaces? I guess. Yeah, this is a very big question, <laughs> um, and it's a question I'm I'm excited to see come up. Really, sorry, I'll just shift this way, but I think I'm kind of poking off the side. I think for me, it kind of again returns to this idea of being a threshold. Um, I think it's time, as you were saying, Theo, to, as academics, get our hands a bit dirty and to engage in the the grit a bit more. Today, it's been it's been. A wonderful relief to hear some action research for example as well um, and a colleague who who spoke today whose name um, um, escapes me noted that they didn't consider themselves to be an academic but they were here presenting and I think that's the that's again another binary that we need to try and dismantle that academic non-academic we're all academics if we're engaging in thought and we're engaging in thinking we are doing academia we are doing knowledge creation we are doing knowledge dissemination and transmission and that for me is very important again it brings up these themes of decolonization breaking down of binaries and i think rejecting this structure of social capital that our knowledges are built upon who says it has to be you know phd student teaching fellow lecturer reader professor Oh, it's a structure. We like structure. Structure is good. Structure is a ladder. We climb up it. We get to the top. We retire. We die. That is where we are. But what does that do for us? And what actually happens within that process when we get embroiled in institutional politics? And we have to maybe step away from our research a bit more. Like I, I, I go by a process of research and from teaching, but I also like to take from my students. I, I try and figure myself as a co-learner in that way with them. I'm a peer um, and they allow me to take some of my teaching back into research. You know, we all start conversations and I think we need to be breaking down these dichotomies of who you can learn from because you can learn from anybody. It doesn't matter who they are. And again, the breaking down these boundaries, the removal of these thresholds. And actually being in a threshold is so monumental because it gives us these options and abilities for change. And this is what I think Altac is, is doing. It is being, putting something out into the world and saying, this isn't working. How about we all get together and have a conversation about what might happen? And it doesn't matter if you're a prof, if you're a teaching fellow, if you're a PhD student, if you're a teacher, if you're anybody, come and join us and have a conversation about this. And let's see what we can co-create together. Um, so I think I'll, 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 I'm going to let Meg John jump in there because I don't know if I have anything else to say at the moment that's not waffle. <laughs> Before they do, I just want to bring... Uh... I'm going to bring a slightly uh, um, a slight pushback in, which is one of the one of the reasons that we have set up full tech um, is because of the massive inequality between different kinds of academics um, and, and and positions. 
and uh, the growing realization for some of us that there probably isn't a space within traditional academia that's going to work for us or is even necessarily available to us. Um, uh, so there's there's also that question, you know, that, that, that on the one hand, it's the coming together for the conversations. And on the other hand is who gets to do this and earn 40 pay a year and who gets to do this in spare moments? Um, you know, and he and and, and, and and I think that kind of we're talking about decolonizing um, institutions. We also need to decolonize resources. Um, yeah. And how do we do that? Uh, and saying that before, just before I hand over, I do want to point out that the support of institutional colleagues over the last uh, couple of days and in putting together this conference has been um, and it, it, it's really persuaded us that there are ways that we can work together. But um, you know, it is a thing that we need to bear in mind, I think, particularly yeah. if you're bringing marginalized communities into academic spaces to speak, you know, um, mm. because there's a process of knowledge extraction thing that can happen as a result uh, in many cases. Not that obviously that's anything you would ever argue for. And I know that I just, you know, just want to bring that a little bit back yeah. down to earth. Yeah. Um, I think in that, we, we definitely have a kind of that hierarchies of disciplines, definitely, and hierarchies even of sub-disciplines within them as well. Um, and as I, I reflected at the start of the day and I reflect now, I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to pursue what I am doing. I, I work for an institution, I, I, I didn't think that was going to happen. I. I think I applied for eight PhD scholarships and didn't get a single one and took the punt because I could luckily support myself through self-employment in order to do this, what I'm doing, and to make that work. So I think in that sense, there's there's a lot of questions there about the, the purpose and the reasons. And I think there's, I'd, I'd hope, and in the perfect utopia, there should be an equal space for all within the, the, the ivory tower or academia or what you call it, but I'm I'm not sure how to get there. And I think to go back to kind of Alison's point, I think I'm in a position at the moment of saying, I don't know, and I need to listen, I need to learn more in order to figure out a way to do that. But I think that's all grounded by support and engagement. Perfect, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, so Megjohn, same question. You're already starting to talk about it. <laughs> what was the, the question? I've got a few things to you say. Know, it's, so <laughs> much said, but, yes. um, but yeah, I mean, the general question is, you know, um, what has today taught us about academia, um, mm. leading on from what you were starting to say already about the ways in which this is both similar and consistent with traditional academic conferences? Yeah, so I think I've got a couple of things to say, one about non about consent in academia and one about marginalised voices, just jumping off what Matt was saying. I've been, I'm glad I can still be an academic, but I've been calling myself a recovering academic, um, which I've been enjoying. <laughs> um, but there's also a reality to that. Um, you know, I do, I, I do notice that a lot of what I've been doing in the year since I left is learning how to treat myself consensually and I wonder how possible that would be within the system. I, I just feel like, I mean, it's not specific to ac academia, it's all capitalist system, but um, it's so hard to treat yourself consensually. And as was, uh, again, I think Chris and maybe yourself mentioned, there's, there's this these kind of movements towards like slow academia or bringing a bit of mindfulness or bringing a bit of yoga or something. And, and it's really just... Uh, well, it's, it's worse than the kind of sticking plaster because it, I think, as Chris said, you know, you have to like do that on top of everything else. There's this kind of like responsibility to self-care so that you can manage, you know, the absolutely, you know, not OK demands of being a, of doing all these things. And I was constantly in academia pointing out it's impossible to, you know, be churning out all these papers and getting funding bids and doing really good research and also teaching and also admin and also management. And as I think people are talking about a bit in the in the chat at the moment also you know being public academic and getting your ideas out widely which isn't something everyone is skilled at and or finds fulfilling and certainly isn't something to add on top of all those other things um so yeah the, then to have this extra thing of like you've got the self-care on top of that um so that you can survive what is really quite toxic um so yeah i've really noticed that 
unlearning that non-consensual treatment that got kind of institutionalized has been a huge piece of work. And again, if we want to take these emotional and embodied practices into academia seriously, we'd also have to change those highly non-consensual systems and structures um, in order that people would be doing something different. So it's, yeah, there's a real question mark for me, real unknowing for me about how you'd even do it. Um, and you know how how safe is how safe is academia for marginalised folks? Um, you know, I'm a trans person who is working in academia, and it you know at the moment in the midst of a trans moral panic, it does not feel like a safe enough place for trans people. You know, most universities they have um, one or two transphobic professors quite often, um, and mostly the universities have responded by well, you know, it's freedom of speech, you know, everybody gets, to, you know, but there's literally a bunch of people very high up who are arguing that trans people don't exist or that they're abusive. Um, and, and, you know, that's, bit, and it's all, you know, often it's dealt with by, oh, well, we'll have a, we'll have a discussion with both sides on the discussion, you know, this kind of false equivalent so yeah it's there's there's big questions in my mind about who it's safe enough for and the other bit you know my work's always been about like what can we learn from the margins and researching with marginalized groups who have generally been a member of myself um as well and you know just noticing that trajectory of mostly the activism and the communities have got places before academics catch up you know so so with queerness i feel like queer activists and queer people in queer communities were saying a bunch of stuff and then queer theorists caught up and now we're just about seeing the queer science catch up it's like this uh, disciplinary kind of role of who catches up you know but you know meanwhile what's happening you know there was this whole period where it was re you know really quite recently where it was assumed that um sexuality was binary and bisexual people didn't exist and you know then queer theory just about caught up <laughs> with it and and the science to you know even back in what was it the the 2010 or so there were still like these scientific papers trying to prove that bisexuality doesn't exist and you know we can laugh about it but the impact that that actually has on people who are experiencing themselves in that way then the mental health health toll we do know about so i feel like yeah bringing marginalized folks into academic spaces definitely needs really thinking about as you say theo and also like why are we not yeah why are we not looking to the margins for that learning um recognizing that this is this kind of wave that often happens is that the yeah the knowledge is there already and we're slowly catching up as academics yeah i think that's what i had to say <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're both fantastic points. Um, I've been uh, struggling with some of this recently as a as a as a trauma survivor. Um, it uh, my research is very much not about trauma and yoga. It's about uh, yoga and teaching relationships. And that was a very deliberate decision on my part to go down that route. And yet increasingly, because I'm known as an activist and I'm known as a, a, a as, as an activist for things like consent and trauma and, and trauma awareness and so on and so forth. Um, what I'm being asked to do, even in academic spaces, is to talk about that. And then that feels really extractive because, you know, um, that's when I'm essentially being asked to use my own history and my own struggle and my own healing and my own pain as material um, for other people with um, institutional positions because they can cope with institutional <laughs> positions to then uh, write lovely papers on. Um, and that feels a very interesting position to be in, uh, in many ways. Um, and I was struck because I was doing, I was doing this piece of work around trauma and I was struck on the development of, uh, with the help of actually with Naomi, who's been an amazing ally on this. I was struck on the development of disability studies and then on the much later development of MAD studies because of the difficulties, uh, in, in, uh, in being openly having mental health issues within academia um, and uh, a good friend Richard Savile Smith who does amazing work in that in that area and you know I part of me is asking at what point do we get trauma studies and what it would take for survivors to actually be in that space and actually get a, a, academia as a whole to understand the very different realities that we live as a result would be um, a really difficult thing to do so you know what does it take um, one of my favourite books, if anybody ha isn't aware of it, is uh, with relationship to this, is Ruth Bihar's The Vulnerable Observer, which is a phenomenal book about being um, doing anthropology from and within marginalised spaces um, and what that means. Um, B E H A R, Ruth Bihar, a brilliant book. Okay, so what I'm going to do right this moment is give you two both a, a, a moment to breathe. 
Um, whilst uh, I'm aware that Sitna can't join us but has sent some notes. So I'm going to bring Vivian up on screen to talk about that and that gives you a moment to breathe and check in with what the chat's saying and so on. And then I'll bring you back afterwards if that's OK. Um, but you can um, you can turn your videos up if you want even um, but, or you can say I don't mind. But I am just going to invite Vivian up. Um, she's great and there's Naomi in the chat there they are yeah. so we're just waiting for Vivian to uh, Vivian's tech to work hey, hey. <laughs> Uh, hello, so, um, Sitna is very apologetic that she cannot be here for this last session. It was a very sudden emergency that she was called away to. So um, she wishes she was here, but obviously things are more important than even this conference. Um, but she did send her notes, and so I was going to just read them straight as she wrote them. So that way her voice is heard as much as possible. Um, um, but so we're going to start with the kind of commentary on what she heard today um, and what that kind of means and what she's been really thinking about in regards to that. And she says, I just want to mention that I really enjoyed the panels and papers that I was able to listen to today. Some of the key topics that emerged in the conversations and presentations were issues of race. For example, Sam Hunter's paper on the lack of diversity among pagan groups. And Annalise's very interesting self-reflective paper on the complexities of the construction of racial hierarchies and intersections with gender in Brazil. The panel on borders and policing migration touched on the complexities of contemporary global migration and the policing of borders through right wing discourses, the demonization and othering of the migrant. Katrina's paper on returnee refugee to Kosovo uh, gave a good sense of how important it is to how important to decenter uh, the study of migration and to listen to the perspectives produced outside of the global north to inform policymaking. We also heard about the uh, political use xenophobia and kissy theories in a pair, which. Oh no, it wasn't just me. <laughs> I'm just whilst uh, Vivian's reconnecting then, I just want to say, uh, if you haven't found it already down at the bottom um, of the screen is a thing saying, ask a question. Um, you are really welcome to pop any specific questions that you have in there <coughs> for the panel. Um, uh, as as uh, that are with us. Um, we, we tried various times to get David's tech to work, um, uh, but it's uh, on three different um, machines. In fact, um, these are the things that happen. Um, so just as uh, Vivian's uh, reconnected, yeah, that thing. We've got a lot of a lot of things popping up in the chat here about unpaid labour in the academy um, at all levels, and I wonder if. Um, um, as <laughs> as Vivian popping up, um, one of the things I do want to say, and I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to this, is that there is there is hope on the other side. It turns out that when uh, when huge amounts of your intellectual labour um, is not being hoovered up by a managerial and um, administrative uh, endeavours, uh, you can actually run a conference on next to no money, for example. I mean, like, there are ways of doing this um, uh, that 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 are that feel more that feel more abundant in terms of the resources that are available, and I want to make any uh, academic aware of that. Um, um, you know, as a real possibility, one of the things that we really want to do with Altac is try and help any academic who wishes it to kind of access these kinds of ways of working in a different way, whether it is. Um, you know, uh, writing books for the general public or running training uh, for specific populations or other, you know, other forms and ways of working because there is work 
you know, it's there and you can get paid to do things that normally you don't get paid for, which is quite nice. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if either of you, Matt or, or Meg John, if you have anything to say on that um, as a possibility. Um, I was more going to circle back to what you were talking about before about um, trauma, actually. Mm -hmm. And just, to, yeah, um, I feel like it's really interesting. I think you're so right about trauma studies. Um, I really appreciate some of the stuff from MAD studies and that's informed what I've been writing. But I'm really, I'm really interested that trauma um, and the impact on my mental health has been something I've written about since leaving. And I don't feel like it was a safe enough thing to write about within the academic acad Academ academy <laughs> academy i can't talk anymore today um partly again partly because of what knowledge is are prioritized and what aren't and i have that kind of fellow academic in my head telling me that a lot of the really great um work out there around trauma isn't isn't the kind of stuff that an academic should be drawing on somehow um it is very interdisciplinary as well and a lot of it draws on um social justice um work as well as drawing on kind of somatic therapies um and neurobiology um and also yeah and just also you know how tra how traumatizing academic um, dynamics and, and spaces can be as well re-traumatizing. I do think of some of my most traumatic experiences of the last 20 years as being within those spaces, um, albeit some of the ones that are less conventionally recognized um, around sort of bullying processes and, and, and just some of the normalized processes of academia, I think that I alluded to at the beginning and how traumatizing those can be. So yeah, I feel like trauma-informed academia and trauma-informed events is a definitely uh, one good way to go. Mm. Okay, anything to add, Matt? I think I just I just want to pick up on something that um, Alan has just put in the chat here about part of the issue of unpaid labour is that we aren't made to feel comfortable with saying no. And that's an issue of consent. It's, it's, it's an issue of consent that's involved in that. And actually, I suppose a theoretical question for me to ask here is actually what would happen to the academy if we all said no to things that we didn't want to do and i think there's a there's a case there for seeing how much reliance there is and it's not just within the academy oh can you mark this extra paper can you do this other can you do this but it's it's about journals we we support an, a publishing industry that makes hundreds and thousands of pounds and charges institutions hundreds and thousands of pounds to gatekeep knowledge from the public um, and I think there's just a wider question there with actually where we're holding the keys are being held away from us in order to make academia and doing knowledge and gaining knowledge accessible to all. I think that's where it sits for me. And again, I don't have an answer and I'm probably just complicating things more, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's this idea of, again, what, what, um, Medan just said here regarding boundaries and imposter syndrome and shame and that a lot of the things that we associate with doing academia are negative emotions. They're emotions of rejections that we don't talk about from journals. They're emotions of getting denied from a grant or an application. And actually, as part of that, I think there, there needs to be some camaraderie and community about normalizing some of these issues as well and actually i suppose again this links back to this idea of trauma and getting to a place where we feel comfortable to talk about that openly and honestly with one another um i think that's yeah. I, I think that's a really nice link yeah and really important points um very much so um uh I, I feel like we could talk about this uh, for a long time and I'm really uh, hoping that the conversation continues in many ways. Um, I'm just uh, looking at the time, I'm looking at the questions. Um, we had two questions popped up here. Um, one from Mara saying, could you please deepen a little on the expert versus lived experience binary, which I think we've, we've, we've talked about a lot really um, in, in many ways. But I'm more interested in actually this conversation from David McConaughey here um, saying, uh, you know, coming from across the Atlantic, can I ask about the comfort of folks using ULTAC as a language? I know there's been some pushback about the language you use to describe public scholarships in all its forms. 
Um, yeah, and uh, yes, it's an interesting language. It, I think in some ways those questions are connected, you know, in what ways are we doing um, public scholarship? In what ways are we doing practitioner-based research? In what ways are we doing ULTAC? Um, and what do these different terms mean? Um, and yeah, if either of you want to kind of talk about that at all, um, really cut that like to be used if you um, furious thinking going on <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not sure what yeah. I have to say I suppose it's worth uh, think interrogating both alternative and academic and wondering if alt if this yeah binary is set up there about what it is to be in academia and alternative to academia um, so I'm sure some of um, Alison's not knowing would be helpful in relation to defining those terms. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I've, I definitely noticed I haven't been loving the word academic for me since leaving. I've been enjoying being somewhat liberated from that, although I was also warmed by Matt's invitation that I could still be an academic. Um, Stuart Hall apparently said on it was only on leaving academia that he could finally become an intellectual. And I rather liked that as a, you know, <laughs> so I've kind of been going more with like independent scholar, intellectual. Um, but again, it's like what forms of knowledge is, does that incorporate and doesn't it? So, yeah, that's all I've got to say on that, I think. I think it's a, I think I should probably say that, that you know, part of that comes from us as, you know, us as Altec UK having embraced that term. And I think part of that is around as, uh, the, as at the core of Altac, mostly being uh, people who were told that our research was, um, you know, brilliant and uh, and kind of, you know, it was brilliant research and we were definitely going to get a job at some point if we just kept trying. Um, and so therefore, you know, you know, at what point do you stop being a kind of, well, I'm an early career researcher who hasn't found a job yet and the shame around that at what point do you say actually I'm something else um, I'm doing so I'm doing something else here because what it takes or, or or the bargains you have to make increasingly to enter that postdoctoral world in particular um, are maybe bargains that many of us increasingly aren't prepared to take and may not even be possible you know when I have senior scholars uh, saying to us well you know it took me eight years to find a job I think Yes, but where will academia, academia be eight years from now? There's no guarantee that there will be a job at the end of that eight years for, for any of us, really. Um, and I think we have to be aware of that. Um, as I am increasingly aware, actually, of institutional colleagues moving away from those environments. You know, um, as more and more academics are leaving, are leaving academia, do the rest of us really want to rush in? Because maybe there's a reason why that's happening. Um, I think uh, so. Yes, uh, these are all fantastic questions uh, and fantastic conversations to have. I'm actually uh, going to let you guys uh, rest at this point, <laughs> um, and um, we uh, we really encourage uh, ongoing conversation, obviously. Um, and um, uh, I know people who pass just in response to the chat. I know people who passed their vivas who are still recovering. <laughs> Never mind, failed them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a difficult thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to bring uh, Alid on screen in a moment just to kind of round up the conference. The next time we do this, we really want to have more space for kind of informal conversations to continue, and we're working with our um, highly resourced uh, technical team of one person who's next door. Um, to make that happen next time. But we will be offering a Zoom space, like I said, for those who are still up for it and, and you know, keep in touch. We have many, many, many plans to come, not least an open access journal for all the reasons we've been talking about. So really, thank you so much and uh, both of you. And also thank you to David and Sitna for trying so hard to be back with us. Um, I am literally gonna, gonna let you go and ceremoniously jump, dump you out so you can, you can come, you can chill. Uh, and reset and let's see just for the last couple of minutes here um, if we can find it. Okay, so Alad is just accepting and connecting now. 
Can you hear me? I can. You're here, my dear. Excellent. Good. Um, firstly, before I get into anything, I just want to comment on how really uh, relaxing and reflective that roundtable was uh, in a really great opportunity to really reflect on not only what we've learned today, but also moving forward as well. That uh, that worked uh, really well. Um, I've got the really easy job at the end of the day, fortunately, because um, my colleagues have very kindly and nicely outlined everything Altac is about uh, in a very eloquent way. But as we're looking at further uncertainty for higher education moving forward um, and how we can't even predict what higher education will look like in six months time, let alone six years or 16 years uh, at this point, um, we hope that everybody can see what we're trying to achieve with Altac as an alternative way to do what we do and not to also pursue what we find exciting as well and uh, what we feel invigorates us. And that's really what we should be encouraging, not the production of capital and so on. Um, so um, to round this off, I actually want to thank certain people for um, what uh, what we have achieved today. And obviously my first thanks obviously goes to my co-founders of Altac, Vivian Asimos and Theo Wildcroft, who are have put an immense amount of blood, sweat, and tears into making sure that today is a success. We did it, and it's good. I also want to give a special thanks to Alison Robertson, who has been instrumental in organizing this conference and has helped us out immensely with organizing panels, going through abstracts, and so forth. So thank you, Alison. And to the uh, moderators as well, uh, who've uh, joined in at, at the last minute to help us chair these panels. So Ed, Giorgio, Jonathan, we really appreciate you and we're really happy that you're really excited to be moving forward with us. And of course, as I said in the chat way further up before this conversation got going, um, today wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the fact that there's an appetite for what we do. And the whether you presented a paper, took part in the roundtable, or if you just came along to listen, today wouldn't have been possible without that. And that this is what this is all about. We're about making conversations, not making lectures, and uh, giving a voice to our research in whichever way um, we see fit. So we've got ideas coming forward, move forward. We're going to have podcasts. We're thinking of a video series and so on. Various accessible ways to put our work out there that maybe we wouldn't even get the opportunity to do if we were in traditional academic uh, environments. So I think I'm going to leave it there because I know we're all very tired. There is a social coming up in a bit. I don't know if I'm going to manage it because uh, organizing the uh, <laughs> today has been absolutely exhausting. But if you do stick around for it, I hope you have fun. And uh, yes, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Um, that's about everything. That's everything for us. Uh, follow us in all the usual places. Be involved in all the usual conversations, and we'll see you soon with very with new things. Um, the next thing I think next priority is the journal. That will be a fun thing to do. Oh yes, and journal as well. Yes. <laughs> if Not you gave paper, you may be getting an email. <laughs> yeah, saying. exactly. All right. Thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again soon.